एवरीवन वेलकम टू मॉडर्न एप्लीकेशन डेवलपमेंट पार्ट टू नाउ कमिंग टू एच टी टी पी वर्ब्स राइट आई ऑलरेडी मैंशन दैट यू वॉन्ट योर यू आर एल्स एज फार एज पॉसिबल टू बी फोकस्ड अराउंड द एंटिटीज द नाउंस विच मीन्स दैट यू कैन असाइन सर्टन मीनिंग्स टू द वर्ब्स दैट आर प्रेजेंट एंड आर ऑलरेडी डिफाइंड एज पार्ट ऑफ द एच टी टी पी स्टैंडर्ड एंड द यूशल आइडिया और देर इज दैट गेट इज मेंट फॉर रीड डेटा राइट वैन यू वॉन्ट टू रीड आई दिस्ट ऑफ डेटा और समथिंग एल्स यू जस्ट स्पेसिफाई इट एज पार्ट ऑफ द क्वेरी यू आर एल ओके एंड द गेट बेसिकली गोज गेट्स ऑल द इन्फॉर्मेशन एंड रिटर्न इट बैक टू यू ओके एंड बिकॉज ऑल द डेटा इज प्रेजेंट इन द यू आर एल इट लार्जली मीन्स दैट गेट रिक्वेस्ट आर कैशबल ओके बिकॉज वंस अगेन द कन्वेंशन इज दैट अ गेट रिक्वेस्ट इज नॉट सपोज टू मॉडिफाई द डेटा बेस विच मीन्स दैट वन गेट रिक्वेस्ट एंड अन अदर गेट रिक्वेस्ट फॉर द सेम यू आर एल आफ्टर सम टाइम शुड गिव मी बैक एक्जैक्टली द सेम डेटा अनल समथिंग चेंज ऑन द सर्वर which makes it very easy to cache because all i need to do is keep track of the urls handled by git and some way by which i can validate or invalidate the cache if needed right so the cache memory can basically say okay you know if somebody else has gone and modified the database in the meantime invalidate these urls or invalidate the entire cache but otherwise if i have mostly only been reading from the cache you know next time i get a get request for a certain url just take it from the cache don't bother hitting the database at all send back the response okay which means that posts for on the other hand right because fundamentally a post does not have much of a url it just has the endpoint to which you are trying to connect but the rest of the information corresponding to the post is present in the post body the request body okay and therefore it sort of makes sense to use a post in order to actually create new data you take whatever is coming in the request body and use it to create a new object in your database and return some kind of a reference to that object okay now what that means is because you are using the same urls right the data is not part of the cache index the data is not getting cached okay and therefore in general post requests are not cacheable okay now keep in mind that a get request in principle could go and modify the database similarly a post request could be used purely for read only purposes right but conventions are that that's not the way you use them when you are doing read only use get as far as possible when you want to create something new use post okay and then of course there are other verbs right put patch delete and so on each of them has a specific kind of meaning associated with it right at the risk of repeating myself too many times i'm going to say it once again these are conventions right keep that in mind when you are actually going through a document of an api there could be nasty surprises at some point that you don't expect right which probably means that whoever wrote the api has done a bad job because breaking a convention is one of the worst things you can do as an api designer right it means that a person is expecting a certain kind of behavior and you are intentionally telling them that oh look i changed it okay and that's not the way people are people are not normally looking for such trip ups right so they might miss that assume a certain kind of behavior do something and get the wrong response altogether okay now a word about output formats right what kind of output format should you use when you're constructing an api the important thing to understand over here is you are usually trying to return some kind of structured data back to the client and what i mean by structured data is you could of course just return the entire html that they need to see right ultimately that's what a flask kind of system does but when flask is operating in api mode you are not really rendering the html and giving back right you don't want to do that because you want to give the front end the flexibility to render in whatever way it likes now xml right as one of the original markup languages is actually very good at this meaning that it can handle structured data very well it can you know clearly indicate hierarchies it can associate types with data right and you can have a very well constructed valid xml document that is very easy to parse the problem is it's also very verbose right and in a lot of cases it is overkill you don't really need that much complexity therefore the popular one today is json right javascript object notation now it has problems in the sense that for example you it has strict limitations on the types of different data that you can specify right 
and structured data for example specifying that something is a type of class cannot be directly indicated in the json itself right you need to have intelligence in the system that actually tells you that yes this is su supposed to be interpreted as a specific type of data okay but it's very simple it's human readable you can literally almost write it out by hand right and it's also very easy to parse in most languages okay although there can be occasional trip ups over there you have to be a little bit careful about how you go about parsing but overall the consensus is that json plus a few extensions of it are the preferred format at present and i'm stating that word at present for a specific reason it's because one of the other things that you need to keep in mind over here is all of these are sort of the best practices and conventions that exist today a few years ago they were not considered best practices right xml was definitely considered superior because it had the ability to handle structured data but the simplicity of json won out over time right is it possible that some other language will become more popular or some other way of representing things will more become more popular later on in time entirely possible okay so keep that in mind but as far as possible in today's uh, environments it's preferable to use the languages and formats that are currently popular simply because they are easy and once again people would be expecting certain kinds of behavior from them now one bit about including links right i had mentioned this a little bit earlier there is a sort of recommendation to include links to various other api endpoints or urls in the response that you give as part of an api request right one of the reasons is if i just see the json output corresponding to a query i don't really know what the request was that led to that query so having a sort of self link right might seem redundant but is actually useful if you are sort of trying to debug or record this for later and in addition to that you could give pointers to other useful information a good example of this is what is uh, followed by the github api right i had mentioned this earlier if you just go to api.github.com/something right you will get a response which is basically a chunk of json text right there is more to it i have left it out over here the first question is oh i saw this chunk of json i don't know where it came from but you remember what i said about self links they do that right they give you the url that was used in order to get this information right here okay so if you go back to this url you will find exactly the same json text again right you also find that there is a unique id over here which means that even at some point if i change my login name the id will remain unchanged okay so there should be some way by which i can translate an id into the login and then get to the url that gives me the data that i need okay or there might be another api request that directly gives me information based on my id without having to even think about the login name now the interesting thing as you go a bit further down is that it also gives you things like a followers url right so who are all the people following me okay on github and similarly it would also give me so called following url which says that is the user enchandra75 my name following another user okay so this would essentially return a, it's supposed to return a kind of boolean the interesting thing is they also make use of the fact that there are specific http status codes that represent success and failure and return one of those codes to indicate a success or a failure okay which means that i could just construct urls now look at this notation here with these curly braces right effectively it's telling me that that's a new parameter to be filled in it's not part of the url okay but if you fill that parameter with something else right then it would give you further information about whether that user is following enchandra75 on github okay so in other words you know you could go further you could have multiple things where there are potentially you know nested such optional parameters and so on all these urls in other words means that if i just go to api.github.com right from there i can start crawling and seeing okay these are the subsequent requests that i get and i can collect a whole lot of useful information just by following those links okay it's sort of a way of discovering what's present in the api now a word about authentication right uh, in the context of apis i have not really spoken anything about authentication uh, it largely follows similar practices to what you would use in the context of securing uh, functions in a flask application for example although of course you know you might 
your backend might be written in other ways, not necessarily only Flask. The thing to keep in mind is how are you going to verify whether someone is logged in or not, right? You cannot really expect that it is interactive, okay? Because at the end of the day, it might, you might of course look for cookies, right? Because at the end of the day, you are saying that the API is going to be used by some front end. The front end can therefore take care of setting the cookie. You now need to be careful. Was the front end that was, uh, you know, where it was being served from and the, where the API is running, are they from the same server? Does the cookie support a sort of cross origin cookie behavior? Uh, if they're running on the same server, of course, it doesn't matter, right? But there are certain issues that you need to take care of when you are performing authentication, especially with an API backend. Today, OAuth 2 is probably one of the best standards that can be used. It's seen in many different places for authenticating APIs, right? Ultimately, what happens is that some kind of a token is being set as part of the authentication process and is then being passed back and forth between the end user, that is the front end, and the back end, which is verifying whether the token is present with each request. So it validates each request before it actually performs the function and gives the response. There are other techniques, JSON web tokens are things that are quite popular these days. This is not something that we can get into in detail at the moment, at least. The main point of advice over here is, once again, use standard techniques where possible, especially in you know, uh, techniques like authentication, okay? Why? Because any mistake that you make over there is a, is a big security problem for your system. It means that you intended to keep something safe and behind an authentication wall and you actually have a problem with how it was implemented, right? Things like OAuth2 and JWT when properly implemented have at least been studied very well by a lot of people and therefore there are good reasons to believe that they are secure, right? At least to the reasonable extent that we know, okay? But if you try to roll your own techniques, there's a good chance that there might be a bug there that you don't catch and somebody else does after you have deployed it. So to summarize, right, the thing is good API design requires experience, right? There's a lot of work that is required in order to build this up. You don't just go read a book and then say, okay, I know how to build a good API. You have to try it out. You have to try it with a team of users who are going to be using your API. And over time, you build up your own conventions for what really works the best. Mostly it is based on conventions. There are very few, if any, rigid rules in this system. Right? But the conventions are important. It's not, once again, something that is just optional. Right? If you don't follow the conventions, there's a good chance you have made your system impossible to use. And the key point to keep in mind when designing an API is you are designing an API for a developer to use, not the end user at the front end. Okay. So now with all of this in place, one word about certain problems that are there with the rest approach, okay? And one of the first problems is most so-called RESTful APIs are violating some constraint or the other of the original REST principles, okay? It's not always obvious what, but there are certain things where people just say that, oh, you know, if you are following certain criteria, then this is a RESTful architecture. It may be, it may not be, okay? So first of all, is RESTful the same as a REST, a REST architecture or is RESTful an approximation of a REST architecture is itself unclear. And the problem is there's a lot of conflicting documentation available online, right? Which can tell you that something either works correctly or it doesn't. Now, in the same context, you need to remember that REST is an architecture style. It's not a design document. It's not something that says, you know, follow these steps and you get an API, right? It is not a set of rigid guidelines. And in some cases, bending the rules can actually make the API design a lot more friendly and easy to use than rigidly adhering to the principles of REST, okay? REST was sort of put down as an architectural style for a reason, right? It was based on a good understanding of what constitutes the web itself, okay? Having said that, REST could potentially be implemented even on protocols that are not just HTTP. There could be other kinds of protocols provided they follow similar kinds of behavior, right? Statelessness, cacheability, and so on, and right, the resource uh, uh, identifiers and so on, if they use similar kinds of structures, you could have a REST architecture implemented with a different protocol. So those are important things to understand. And 
what you need to understand is you are interested in designing a web API, not necessarily a REST API. If it turns out to be REST, good, because that means that is following fairly good principles or a good architectural style. But if you need to bend it or break it for some reason, you need to know why you are doing so and that it is okay to do so. One of the problems with REST right, is that it is sometimes called a chatty protocol, meaning that a lot of back and forth requests are required in order to get the data corresponding to a single view sometimes. Okay? Let's say that you want to get like the top students in a course. First, you get the details of a student, then you'll get the list of, or rather, you want to get something about you know, their grade point average. Right? You get the details of a student, you take the list of courses taken by the student, can then get the details of each course, aggregate marks in each course. It's potentially possible that if you don't have a single function on the API that gives you all of this, you'll have to do many such requests back to the server in order to collect all the information that you need. Okay. The REST structure also specifies a certain set of requests that are permitted. It's not a general query language, right? And even something as simple as saying, okay, you know, how do I specify what is needed? Let's say that I want to retrieve something about a student, but I'm not interested in their date of birth or their address or their uh, hostel room number. I only want their roll number and their name, okay? Usually what happens with the kind of REST architecture is that, or REST APIs, is that you put a request for a user, you get back all the information corresponding to the user, and then you choose what to do with it, okay? But is there a simple way to sort of specify that I only wanted their roll number and name? It's not naturally part of the REST architecture, but there are a number of APIs that you will actually see, including things from Google, where you can specify the fields that you want. Are those following RESTful architectures? Possibly, I mean, why not, right? I mean, it's not really fundamentally breaking anything in REST to ask for only a subset of the fields. But it means that you are complicating your query structures a lot more. As you start to look at these kind of structures in more detail, you will find that there are a number of such special cases that you need to deal with. And that is where it sometimes makes sense to say, okay, is there a better way of handling this entire way of making queries from a server? And that is what we are going to look at next.